Shalom Chavarim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Lots been going into the world, and of course, we've been kind of out of pocket getting ready for our U.S. trip there. Of course, don't forget those of you that would like to attend. Uh, we do still have, oh, about three dozen tickets left for the conference there that we'll be speaking at in Duluth, Georgia. You can go to the website globalversusflatearth.com. Uh, that's only because we are hosting also a debate between uh, that of uh, Dr. Steve Pigeon and author Zen Garcia. Be a very insightful but a friendly, loving debate. Something we're really wanting to accomplish with this debate was to show how that Christians can come together even though they might have differing views and yet speak of those views and share their reasons why they believe it in a friendly and a godly atmosphere and not so much as throwing each other under the bus because, well, the other thinks the other one doesn't have the spiritual knowledge or insight that they do. Kind of like the rapture idea. That happens a lot too. So we really wanted to do it more so uh, because we see so many people making comments uh, saying, you know, going to the flat earth idea. And we wanted to be able to present both uh, views there for you to be able to see for yourself and see what you think. And yet at the same time, see that two men can come together or two women, whatever the case were to be, and could debate in a friendly atmosphere with respect and love and dignity for one another. So we hope that you're able to make that. Uh, again, like I said, there's about three dozen tickets still left available. At this point, too, if you do buy your tickets, we have refunded several tickets, uh, people that had last minute cancellations. But at this point now, uh, we really cannot do a refund policy at this point because we're afraid that if people were to cancel at the last minute, then we would have no way to fill those seats again. And the reason we even have tickets is because of the cost to do the event. Uh, anyway, let's get right into our broadcast today. There's a lot of things going on, as you well know already, uh, but I wanted to start with some key critical information. China advanced destroyer to take part in joint drills with Russia in the Baltic Sea. That's pretty provocative right there. Can't say as I blame Russia, though the U.S. has been doing a lot of drills there in the Baltic Sea. There's been both uh, sky up in the air. There's been close encounters with Russians, uh, B-52 bombers, U.S. bombers, the Sequoia, the bombers from Russia, etc. We know the U.S. also did a major drill uh, landing with the United States Marine Corps uh, with the Ukrainian government. Uh, I'm going to go into another issue about the Ukraine government as well uh, this evening. I want to share something with you on that. Uh, and also... Uh, we, we are seeing that with China and Russia joining forces there together, sends a message to NATO uh, that there is a separate alliance joining together that's not part of NATO and that countries are coming together to show their particular side of the way they see things in the world there. I uh, can't say I support one or the other in this here. I would love to see world peace, not world violence. Uh, but unfortunately, that's just not the way it goes. Also, the U.S. is expanding uh, anti-Iran sanctions over ballistic missile program. Again, can't say as I blame the U.S. on doing something like that, but the U.S. Treasury Department has targeted uh, a, quite a few Chinese companies as well. This in the midst, uh, in the, midst of, uh, the United States trying to work with China on defusing the North Korean tensions there. Uh, but so now they're expanding these sanctions. And of course, that also has to do with uh, North Korea, believe it or not, indirectly, because North Korea does supply technology to Iran for their nuclear program. That's a bit concerning for Israel, no doubt. Uh, because the more technology that falls into Iranian hands, the greater chance Iran has of being able to launch a preemptive strike on Israel uh, with nuclear weapons. That all being said, uh, we did report uh, a couple of years ago that Iran already has nuclear weapons. That's something that a lot of people kind of take for granted, have no idea that that is the case, but it is true according to one defective scientist uh, who defected from Iran, claims that yes, indeed, uh, that Iran does have nuclear weapons. Uh, that was actually reported by a good friend of ours, uh, uh, and uh, my brain is blank on the name of the program that he reported that on, so I have to draw, won't be able to speak about that at this moment there, but uh, I remember listening to that. He shared that with me. Anyway, the Jerusalem Post come out with an article, U.S. Russia tout Israel's security needs amid concerns of Iran uh, in Syria. 
All right, now this is something that really brings mixed emotions for me because I really do understand Israel's security concerns of Iran on its border as well as Hezbollah. Also, the fact that Iran is wanting to build land, sea, and air bases in Lebanon, of all places, uh, not to mention uh, Israel's concerned about Iran, Iranian proxies building military bases anywhere along its Golan Heights border there. These are things that uh, President Netanyahu said is totally unacceptable. And even though there have been reports that Israel was part of the negotiations for the ceasefire in southern Syria, there, uh, Israel claims that they were not as fully uh, part of these negotiations as it's been made to believe, be believed by CNN News. That, though speaking, President uh, Netanyahu, excuse, Prime Minister Netanyahu has clearly stated that they still will defend their, their red lines, and if they are crossed by the Iranian proxies or Hezbollah or even Syria, they will target that, and they will not honor this ceasefire that is going on. That being said, too, I have to say I've never believed that the ceasefire was meant for any other reason but for the benefit, of course, both sides. Israel is saying it's a benefit for Syria and the Iranian proxies to get rearmed, repositioned for a new offensive. And at the same time, Syria does have a right to be able to defend its own interests with Al-Qaeda and ISIS in those two regions there. And why would they broker a ceasefire only for them to be able to gain more momentum to strike back at, of course, uh, Syria and uh, Damascus, uh, no doubt. Speaking of Damascus right now, on the eastern frontier of Damascus, they have been suffering heavy losses. The Syrian proxies that are fighting there on the suburbs of East Damascus. In fact, uh, the Syrian army had to send in some of their SU uh, bombers and were doing some heavy bombing this afternoon. I did have some video footage for that. Hopefully I can play it and kind of add it to the video afterwards. But yes, they were doing some heavy bombing uh, in that region. They're trying to slow the advance down. Very disturbing indeed because of Damascus Damascus loses its eastern front, it will not be hard for those regions in the south and over to the west to also gain the upper hand on the Syrian military and also take down Damascus to the west. Again, I believe that this is exactly what Rome would like to see, is that uh, this would all fall so that they could see the, the scripture of Isaiah 17 coming into full fulfillment, that Damascus has become a ruinous heap and has ceased from being a city. Uh, some people may not like that very well, but I do think that that's the case. And I think that a lot of times, sometimes with the Israeli government, that they're playing into the hands of the Vatican as well. And, and let me say something too on that, because sometimes I get accused of being anti-Israel uh, because I call out my government's hand on things that are being done that are not according to the way that the, 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 our, our Father of Heaven would actually have us to do. But let me just point this fact out as well. Many of you that are Bible-believing uh, uh, Christians, uh, you support Israel unconditionally, but did we do we support uh, the ideology that Israel would allow uh, the gay parade to be done in Jerusalem? Many of you may not even be aware of when the gay community, they were asked by the Israeli government uh, to do the parade in Jerusalem. The gay and lesbian community did not even want to do a a march in Jerusalem. They did not want to do a parade there because they feared the Orthodox community, but the government themselves were the one that pressed for this to be done. That kind of makes you wonder then, does everything our government, everything that the Israeli government does, is it correct? Is it the right thing to do? That's why I say, I support my people, I support the Jewish people and their rights in the way that they believe to be a free people and to serve the, 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 to serve God, the God of Israel, the way they do towards the dictates of their heart. But not everything that the government does is on the up and up. And I also have to say, as I've stated before, and I'll continue to state this, Israel started becoming a nation again, not in 1948, but in 1858, when the Ottoman Empire the Ottoman Empire was evil as in, 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 regardless, but because they needed tax money, they began to allow the Jews, Jews to buy property inside of Israel, and that's when the migration of the Jewish people first began, kind of like that of Abraham. He was a pilgrim and a stranger, but he bought the land in Hebron. He paid for it. That land belongs to Israel. So, same thing, they came back and they began to purchase the land once again. 1948 was more a plea of the Vatican to try to make sure they controlled how Israel became a nation. And that's why I watch very closely of the actions inside the government of Israel, whether or not it's in line with that for the sake of the Jewish people, or is it in line with what the Vatican would like to see happen. Don't forget, 
Daniel also prophesies in chapter 11 that the sons of the lawless of your people, Daniel's people, will try to marry the vision. And that marrying the vision, the Mechodesh, what the Catholic Church is trying to do to bring in the three monotheistic religions and unite them inside of Israel, was exactly what Daniel warned against. So we should be vigilant and watch how these things are coming, to, uh, coming about in, in, in Israel. Uh, also, a little bit of vindication. You know, we reported on Israeli News Live, what, I guess, back in, uh, might even been about a year ago now, we were reporting how that the, uh, the Russian military, in retaliation for the De Azor incident, bombed a facility uh, in Aleppo that killed a special force, not special force, but, but uh, secret intelligence operatives that were from the United States. They were from... Um, Turkey, Qatar, they were from uh, Syria, excuse me, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Israel, uh, all these nations, Turkey, Israel, U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Qatar were all involved in a secret operations booth there. Well, very interesting uh, documentary or, or, or interview came out just recently uh, with the former Prime Minister of, of Qatar after being really lamb blasted uh, by the US and by the uh, Saudi Arabian government that the Qatar is supporting, supporting extremists. Uh, and he comes out and that happens to be Hamad bin uh, Yassim bin Jabal al Thani. He acknowledged that the US and its allies backed Safai jihadists in Syria. He goes into an in-depth interview there uh, that was actually on uh, Charlie Rose uh, 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 in his particular uh, interview that he did on, uh, on June the 12th. Uh, that was a very interesting interview to see what Charlie Rose had to, uh, in the questioning there in this interview. But uh, this ex-Prime Minister of uh, Qatar clearly shows how the U.S., how the Saudis have also been heavily involved in supporting the most extreme jihadists inside of Syria to, the, to toppling Bashar al-Assad. Uh, so it just seemed for us as a little bit of a vindication, in my opinion, there, because we stood by this when the world never wanted to report on this, that this was the case. Uh, also, uh, foreignpolicy.com reporting, why isn't Russia worried about Kim Jong-un's nukes? Even after one of uh, the, the uh, missiles that he was test firing fell off the coast of Russia, closer to Russia than it did Japan. Well, as Putin pointed out, he says, you know, diplomacy would work a lot better. And after all, uh, he said, we can promise them their security. You remember I told you back in 1967, Japan, or excuse me, China had also vowed to protect North Korea. It's an actual document signed in 1967 that they would protect them if any nation ever came against them. Now, now Russia, President Putin is doing the same, vowing to protect North Korea uh, in exchange for you know, they would work with them on their nuclear program. And their actions speak louder than words. Uh, Russia also has sent in uh, 200 and I think four tons of uh, wheat flour for the nation as a humanitarian aid in the crisis with all the blockades and the sanctions that the, uh, the U.S. and the coalition have been doing against them. NATO, the United Nations have put against them. Um, Kind of last and uh, but not uh, least here, of course, it did happen yesterday. 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake off the coast of Russia to the very far east, not far from Alaska either, I might add. Uh, but uh, definitely, uh, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, earthquakes in diverse places just goes to show the hour we are living in. And I might add real quick, let me just share one other thing with you guys here. Um, on uh, speaking about uh, news there, I want to go back to Daniel. I mentioned to you the other day, Daniel 11:31, and I've had a little bit more time. We actually, in our television series, we go into the Arch of Baal and more of this prophetic insight that I was sharing the other day about the Antichrist himself and how that this verse in uh, in Daniel 11:31 is a little bit translated odd. I did a literal translation myself to give you a better idea of what it actually says. In English we read, an arm shall stand on his part and they shall profane the sanctuary, even the stronghold, and shall take away the continual burnt offering, and they shall set up the detestable thing or the abomination that maketh 
desolate, is how it's written in the King James. King James is actually more accurate in, in, the, uh, in this. Let me just take you real quick to the King James Version uh, side of this. I think it, it's only fair that we do this so that we can see exactly what Daniel is stating here uh, in the King James uh, Version. And I think it is, well, we just go to 31. And uh, because this is important, as I mentioned to you, uh, here we go. An arm shall stand on his part. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination to make it desolate. All right, now let me blow this up a little bit for you because I want you to notice too in 31. The, work on here, the word on here, sacrifice, is italicized. Anytime King James Version uh, adds a word that's not in the original text or the language, they italicize it. That's kind of nice of the KJV to do this because it lets us know that word doesn't exist in the sentence and shall take away the daily. That's all we would actually read. But when you look at this in Hebrew, it comes together all together. As I mentioned the other day, the word arm in Hebrew would have would be Zayn Resh Vav Ein, not Zayn Resh Ein. Zayn Resh Ein is for the word seeds or lineage, and it is plural seeds, because it says Uzarim, Mimenu, Ya Amadu. All right, let me show you what it actually, if you, I did my own translation, I should say, more of a literal translation, but not exactly literal, kind of like they're doing as well to where you can make sense of it. But I put on here the arm. You could use the arm if you want, but I would say the seed or the lineage from which they stand will wound and take away the strength of the holies. Uh, they shall give in place the abomination that desolate, desolates. And that's the way it really should be translated because if you notice, what is it? The lineage from which they stand. This is a continuing seed or group of people that they would take from their position and they would wound the strength of the Holy or the Holy One because Yeshua is the Holy One of Israel. He is the Holy. He is the temple of God, in fact. You know, it's not God. As Jesus said, it's, you know, he's, you know it's, it's a body that has prepared me. I think that's David that actually states that a body has thou prepared me. Not, not a physical temple, but a body has thou prepared me. And they come to wound that body. If you really look at what the verse is saying, there is a lineage from which they stand, okay? Position of power, in other words, will wound and take away, they take away the strength of the Holy of Holies. All right? Which he is that strength. Remember, God, Christ is what? He's El Gibor. All right, and then he goes on, they shall give in place the abomination that makes desolate. That's why I believe that we see in there in the Shem Tob's Hebrew, it says that the Antichrist, that is the abomination that stands, that makes desolate. And John says, what? There's many Antichrist. And we find out if you look at Daniel 11, 31, when it speaks about the abomination that comes, it's a lineage a lineage of those that put, what are they doing? They're replacing Christ with an abomination that will make desolate. What has Rome done? First, it started with, with uh, political Rome that destroyed the temple. They destroyed, you know, they destroyed Christ first, get him out of the way. Isn't that interesting that when Christ, when he was dying, the veil of the temple was rent? from the top to the bottom. I believe it wasn't just the temple veil itself, but it was the veil on those eyes of the Jewish people that they could see that there was their Messiah. But when that temple, when the, when the, when the veil of the temple was, was torn from top to bottom, Christ died. The way to the Holy of Holies was revealed. And Christ was that way. And if you notice, the temple also had its own death. Philip mentions this in his writing in one of the Apocrypha writings where Philip speaks about this as well. That the temple was also abandoned and destroyed. Just like Christ was abandoned and destroyed as well. And they put in place the abomination that makes desolate. And from the time of Titus, the Roman general, when he come down, that's exactly what he did. He destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. 
He was standing in the holy place. But he was only one of those abominations. And from that time forward, since the Rome, reviving of the Roman Empire, the world has been constantly dominated by the abomination where they have tried to replace Christ with some hierarchy of the Vatican instead of the true sacrifice, Jesus Christ, that died for our sins. And so what do we get? An abomination in place of Christ that does nothing but desolates the entire world with wars. So it may seem like a little bit off in what we're talking about here, but it's not. We are literally talking about all these wars, and we see these wars that are happening in the Middle East and all around the world. Tidings out of the East, now the North, they trouble him, who, the king of the North, that abomination that makes desolate the entire world through his wars, just so that he can keep control over the religious hierarchy. We truly need the coming of Christ once again. But not there. And by the way, some of you have written me about the alien Antichrist. They're going to present an alien Messiah. I do believe that is the hope of humanity. But every pontiff has been an abomination. He has been an Antichrist. As John points out, there were many. They went out from us because they were not of us. When it says that you know that he's the Antichrist because he does not believe that Jesus is the Christ, that's exactly right. They don't believe that he is the anointed, that he is the Christ, that he, they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. They are looking, as Daniel said, they're looking for their Nagid, their prince that is to come, but he's not an anointed prince. And that prince that shall come would be of the people that destroy the, city, the temple and the sanctuary. Now, some have also written to me, they said, Steve, what about the Assyrian Antichrist? Do you not realize that the Pope is a Syrian as well as he's a Jew and as well as he is a Roman? He's all three. Hadad was the sole surviving heir to, to Esau's descendants. As a little child, they took him and hid him with Pharaoh in Egypt. He's also an Egyptian for that matter. He marries the sister of the Pharaoh's wife. When he becomes of age, he asks for leave. He goes to Syria. Not, he said he wanted to go back home. David was dead, but he doesn't. He goes to Syria, becomes the king of Syria. And then his children, of course, as they're born, they intermingle with the Syrians. Now he's Syrian as well. And then what does he do from there? He goes into northern Africa. From northern Africa, Obadiah shows that he is part of the Roman Empire. So he is Roman. He is Assyrian. He is a son of Abraham, because Esau is a descendant of Abraham. And then when you say, well, how could he be a Jew then? Because some say it's a Jewish Antichrist. Well, it's easy. Every pope that is, or excuse me, every priest that is a Jesuit priest can only be that priest if he has proven to have Jewish lineage. That's what a Jesuit really is. So, Bergoglio, Pope Francis, fits the bill for all three. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Prophetic segment. Wasn't really planning on going that direction. I just kind of ended up going that way. I hope it's a blessing to you. And uh, again, we will be coming to the United States. We fly out next week. I uh, have a lot going on. It's one reason why we've been a little bit slow in trying to get our broadcast out really under the gun uh, right now. Uh, we have to move some of our stuff in storage because we'll be in the U.S. for several months there. Uh, and we don't want to waste money here because our lease was coming to an end anyway. Anyway, God bless you. Shalom. Hope to see you in Duluth, Georgia. Don't forget, I'll post it here on the, in the description below. Uh, you can buy tickets there at uh, our, um, at the conference. I'll be speaking there myself on Sunday. Yana will be speaking on vaccines, transhumanism. We have Laurel uh, Austin be speaking as well on her uh, experiences with vaccines with four of her children. Zen Garcia, uh, both him and Steve Pigeon will be speaking separately besides the debate they will be doing on the flat earth. So we trust it will be a blessing for you. Two-day event, 5th and 6th of August 2017 in Duluth, Georgia. It'll be at the Holiday Inn in Duluth, Georgia. Get your tickets while you can. Go to the website, globalversusflatearth.com. Shalom.